my introductory lecture with Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity, but I warned that we were going to need to backtrack to the period before Christianity received imperial protection and then imperial adoption. Most of the very early Christian art we have comes from catacombs or tunnels and rooms carved into the limestone tufa beneath the city. These are very cool to explore, by the way, and they really give you a sense of the secretive, embattled status of the early church. The picture on the right gives Gives you a sense of how these catacombs look today, although electric lighting does take away something from the experience. This is not our required work, the catacombs of Priscilla, but it's quite similar and I've kept this slide because it contains so many useful vocabulary words and so that I would not have to rework all those circles and arrows. You saw these terms in the Khan Academy video, I hope. Polygonal frame is a term now used in computer graphic design, and it means just what it sounds like, a geometric shape drawn around a painting or design. In this case, an oval that contains a spoked wheel pattern of paintings. An orant is a figure with both arms raised in prayer. A lunette refers to a semicircular space, often above a door or a window, and often decorated with fresco paintings or mosaics. I'm going to say relatively little about this required work since it was so well explained in the Khan Academy video, including why I label this so-called. Let me repeat a point I've made before, but one that is especially important for this unit. You're going to be looking at a few works, specifically a few famous churches, in detail, and we're going to rely heavily on the homework to cover the other works. If you skip the homework and the College Board decides to ask, say, six questions on one of these images, you will find yourself seriously messed up. It's your choice, but you know what Ms. Jacobs and I recommend. Note that what looks like architectural features along the wall is actually just a painted surface. We've seen this before in first style Roman painting in Pompeii, and I would not put it past the College Board to draw that comparison. So what is this painting showing? The conventional interpretation of the painting is that we see the dead woman in three stages of life, getting married, raising children, and praying. That's the orant pose in the center. Note that the modeling of her face is more three-dimensional than the Byzantine paintings that we'll be seeing soon, and even more the Byzantine mosaics. The Roman painting tradition is still alive and well at this point. Remember, this is not actually very distant in time from Pompeii. So you see here the man and wife from Pompeii. And what similarities do you see with the Orant? And what symbols do you see in the pendentive? Those are the somewhat uh, triangular corners beneath the, the shallow dome, and for that matter, in the shallow dome itself. We see doves, which are a symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit, and we see peacocks, which I did not know are a symbol of eternal life. Now, I don't see the quail that was mentioned in the Khan Academy podcast, at least on this photo, but they represent the earthbound life. Sorry, I'm pulling this up. Now, the College Board has never really explained why it chose this work, which is not as well known as some of the catacombs and, frankly, harder to get information about. But one theory that popped up on the AP Teacher Listserv I thought I should share with you because it could be the reason why this work was chosen for the list. So it turns out that these particular catacombs and images have been the center of some controversy whether, over whether they might demonstrate that women played a different role in the early church than was generally believed or than the Catholic Church teaches. So this painting from the Catacombs of Priscilla, it is not one of the required images, has generated some of the controversy. We see a figure breaking bread and she has been identified by dress and hair as a female. Could this mean that women served communion? Of course, we don't know that this is even a painting of communion. It could be a funeral banquet. Uh, this image also has led some people to suggest that the central praying woman, or Orant, is actually a priest. Now, there are other paintings in the set that show her as a bride and a mother, so this strikes me as a little far-fetched. Vatican archaeologists have responded that the painting, like so many in the catacombs, shows a deceased person entering paradise. The hands raised in prayer are a common feature of catacomb art. 
Still, it's not hard to see how the Oran might be thought to resemble a priest. If nothing else, I think this is a good example of how a work of art can be reinterpreted in a later era. At any rate, I want you to be aware of this debate, just in case, and if you'd like to know more, I've posted articles about the controversy on Moodle. Now, I find this a frustratingly degraded and blurry work. There are much better Good Shepherd examples from other catacombs, and there are better examples in the catacomb of Priscilla itself. I just don't know. Go figure. You do need to be aware that Christ the Good Shepherd is one of the most common ways that Christ is portrayed in early Christian art. The early images of Christ, in fact, almost always show him as a beardless young man. They not only show him as the Good Shepherd, but also teaching his disciples. Much as Socrates and other classical era teachers discussed philosophy in the Agora or Forum. Again, this would have been a kind of teaching and a kind of depiction that would the classical audience would have been comfortable with, familiar with. Uh, so here is a famous Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital of Ravenna. Not a required work, but one of my favorites. Uh, I got confused by this myself. The Khan Academy video actually discusses a different Good Shepherd fresco from the catacombs of Priscilla than the one that is a required image from the college board. Remember, it was a huge complex and Good Shepherd scenes were popular. But here at any rate is the College Board required ceiling fresco. In this version, we once again see Christ the Good Shepherd in a roundel, surrounded by prefiguring scenes from the Old Testament in lunettes or half circles. Prefiguring, again, are stories from the Old Testament that refer in some way in Christian theology uh, to, the, to Christ's life and resurrection. Confession time. I tried and failed to find close-up photos that seem to be from this particular fresco. But the Old Testament seems apparently are Adam and Eve. Remember, Christ is the new Adam, freed from sin. Jonah sitting under a plant, cursing Nineveh. Jonah, too, was buried for three days and then returned to live. He was buried, of course, in a fish. Moses striking the rock to get water for his people. Like Jesus, Moses freed people from captivity, and Jesus, of course, also provided living water. And finally, Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac as Jesus sacrificed himself for humankind. Well, I'm hoping this is enough information. Given the bad condition of these images, I doubt you'll be asked to identify something that is almost impossible to see. Okay. Fasten your seatbelts. We are now entering a period of the course where you will start to collect a portfolio of churches and you will need to download a load of architectural terminology into your mental hard drives. I hope you saw my note on the study guide about how medieval churches were the perfect storm for AP students. Well, as always, we're trying to help you run faster than the other deer. Apparently, there weren't many church architecture questions on last year's test. There may not have been any at all. Uh, I only know because students complained they'd spent a lot of time studying that and then they didn't have to use it. My guess is that means that you will encounter church architecture questions this year, maybe even an essay question. So you're forewarned, right? Let's get started by reviewing the basic Roman basilica, which was the basis for many of the imposing churches built in the reign of Constantine and his immediate successors. You've seen this slide before. Do you remember what it is? This is a reconstruction of the Basilica Ulpia from Trajan's Forum, which was not a church, of course, but a public administration building. So why did the now imperially approved Christian church adopt a basilica plan? Well, they needed a space that would hold a lot of people. They also wanted to convey imperial approval for the new religion. And using a famous imperial style, a government style, helped send that message. And they needed a longitudinal plan, in other words, a long rectangle leading to an altar. The basilica's long nave and apse serve well. Note that the apse in the church is moved from the side to the end so they can hold the altar. The Khan Academy video about Santa Sabina mentioned Old St. Peter's. Here's a floor plan of that long since demolished church, basically it was replaced with the new St. Peter's, not so new. Uh, and you see some helpful labels. Note one very important departure from the basilica. Worshippers entered through the narthex on the short end of the rectangle opposite the apse. And this led their eyes immediately down the nave toward the altar, which was the focal point of worship. Another innovation was the transept. 
That's a hall that is perpendicular to the main hall, or the nave. As we'll see in a minute, your required early Basilican church, Santa Sabina, did not have a transept. But other churches we study well. Old St. Peter's is the first known building with a transept. But they would become common elements of Christian churches, not least because they transformed a basic rectangular building into a building shaped appropriately like a cross. Old St. Peter's was designed to hold three to four thousand worshipers at a time, a far cry from the house churches or small crowded catacomb chapels where early Christians had secretly worshipped. The nave alone was as long as an American football field. So this is a required work, and I hope and trust you watch the excellent Khan Academy video on this church because I'm going fast. So quick review. What kind of columns do you see? They're Corinthians. You see those acanthus leaves on top. And they were, in fact, taken from older Roman buildings. The term for that architectural recycling is spolia, and we've seen it before, for example, in the Mosque of Cordoba. So what basilican features do you see? There's a high, flat wooden roof. Side aisles with a lower roof, you can see them sticking out in the photo of the exterior, and a rounded apse at one end. Here is Santa Sabina's floor plan, another required image. The round building to the left housed a baptistry, but the side buildings don't really constitute a true tr transept. And here we see what A, B, and C are, the nave aisle apse. Now, this is not a required image, but the carved doors of Santa Sabina are some of the oldest surviving works of Christian art, and the panel on the upper left, which I've enlarged, may be the earliest depiction of the crucifixion that has survived. The art in the catacombs, understandably enough for tombs, focused on resurrection rather than crucifixion and death. Note that the doors are carved with stories, with narratives, although I realize it's hard to read the labels on the slide. From the very beginning, churches used art to tell the biblical narrative, especially important as we move into the early Middle Ages and literacy drops dramatically. Well, in 330, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire east to the town of Byzantium. Now, he had a lot of reasons for making this move. He wanted a fresh start for his Christian empire, and Rome was filled with monuments to pagans. But the move also reflected some geopolitical realities. The West was increasingly under siege from Germanic tribes, what we used to always call the barbarians. The East was under siege from the Persians, but Constantinople was more easily defended, especially by a navy. Note its location. The East was richer than the West and therefore more important to defend. And let's face it, Constantine did not suffer from a deflated ego. He liked having his own namesake capital. Constantine died seven years later in 337. I won't try to describe the succession crises that followed. Basically, there was a lot of mayhem and fratricide. The next really important emperor from our standpoint is Theodosius, who ruled uh, about 40 years later, from 378 to 395, and was the last emperor to rule an undivided empire. Theodosius declared Christianity the empire's only legal religion. Constantine had just given it approval. He helped settle theological disputes within the church, and he destroyed many pagan temples, holy sites, and images. He even, I bet this was unpopular, disbanded the Olympic Games. He divided the emperor between his two sons. Uh, one of these sons moved the capital of the Western Roman Empire to Ravenna. Since it was surrounded on all sides, either by sea or by swamps, Ravenna was easier to defend from the many Germanic invaders and closer to the eastern capital of Constantinople. We're going to get back to Ravenna in a moment, but first, let's move into some Byzantine history. Actually, the dividing line between late antiquity and the Byzantine Empire is not as clear as the labels make it seem. Constantine established the new Roman capital at Byzantium, renaming it Constantinople, but he would have called himself a Roman and not a Byzantine emperor. Theodosius, while he still ruled over an undivided Roman Empire, governed from Constantinople and imposed Christianity on an empire that was still predominantly pagan. 
All historians would call Justinian a Byzantine Empire, yet he was also the last Roman emperor to speak Latin as his first language instead of Greek. And he drove his empire close to bankruptcy with military campaigns aimed at winning back Western territory from Germanic tribes. They were largely successful, by the way, but the Germans took them all back just a few years later. Byzantine rulers were a mixed lot, but they all ruled as head of both the government and the church. The struggles between popes and kings that would define much of Western European medieval political history had no real parallel in the Byzantine Empire. Patriarchs were important personages, as were bishops, and they had a lot of influence. But basically, when emperors said jump, patriarchs and bishops said, how high? The two great Byzantine churches we will look at, one today, one tomorrow, were both commissioned by Justinian. He and his Empress Theodora, shown here in the mosaics from San Vitale in Ravenna, were really a piece of work. Let's watch two clips from a video about the Byzantine Empire. The first gives you some background on these two rulers. The second video clip starts off just after a major riot against Justinian's rule, mostly sparked by the very high taxes he imposed to pay for his military adventures and ambitious building program. Justinian, as you'll see, wanted to cut and run. Theodora, a former circus performer, prostitute, porn star, and all-around tough broad, as we'll see, had other ideas. The, the video leaves off with an introduction to Hagia Sophia, which is, by the way, the Greek pronunciation of the Church of Holy Wisdom. We will spend almost all of the next class on this incredibly important church, which we've already encountered in our Islamic art unit as the inspiration and goad to Sinan, uh, whose uh, beautiful Mosque de Derni is also one of our required works. You're going to get to hear a different disembodied voice talk about this church and about two other major churches from this unit, so enjoy the break, but miss me, okay? By the way, this video continues with an excellent and quite different analysis of Iosevia, that is the one you just watched, which focuses more sharply on its engineering. It's up on Moodle. Feel free, of course, to watch it. So we're going to end this class by looking at Justinian's second most famous church, San Vitale in Ravenna. I did not assign this long Khan Academy video because I want you to watch it in class and discuss it in class. You're going to read about both of these churches in your next homework assignment, and there will be quiz questions from this video as well as the reading. So as this slide notes, I want you to pay special attention to a few elements of this work. What was Justinian's purpose in building this church in Ravenna? So the answer to function goes beyond just church. What is the difference between a central and a basilican plan? This unit's matching quizzes include some rather brutal sacred space floor plan matching questions. You might want to start practicing. How are the portrayals of Christ evolving? Remember the youthful good shepherd we just saw? Increasingly, images of Christ will become older, more focused on power and omnipotence as opposed to teaching, shepherding, and performing miracles. Notice how imagery combines religious messages with some very strong messages about power and authority. Note the changing stylistic conventions and again, a move away from naturalism to stylized figures that follow those conventions. And finally, pay attention to mosaic terms and